publishing has changed, readers have changed and their expectations have changed and everything is so much more um, instant gratification. I mm -hmm. felt like mm -hmm. I was very aware of that as I was writing. <laughs> Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where our guest today is Wendy Corsi Stubb. We are going to be talking about her latest suspense novel, not suspense, not thriller, and we're going to talk about that. The Other Family, her first standalone novel in 10 years, which I just cannot even believe it's been 10 years. I absolutely love this book. It's going to be a Book Reporter bets on selection because when you start reading this, you're going to be going, da 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 da, da. what is really going on here? So welcome, Wendy. It is so great to have you here. Oh, thank you, Carol. It's so great to see you. I wish we were in person, but it's so nice to see your face again. And thank you, book reporter. And it's like, wait a second, if I had a drink in my hand, we could just have a little cocktail in our hand. Like our, that's usually where we see each other. So yes. I'm trying to remember what number book is this for you? Is this 90? This is something crazy. It's some huge number, 90 something. Yeah, it's a huge number. It's like up in there, somewhere in the, in the 90s, I think. So okay. I can count and get back to you, but math was never my thing. English major. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's words. Words are what really, really works. So let's start with you telling everybody about the other family, because there's just this great setup to the book. So you're on. Okay, this book is about a family that is a California family. So they're moving cross country to Brooklyn and um, they move into this house. And it sounds kind of almost cliche if I like sort of say, well, they move into a house where there were unsolved homicides. Um, but there's a lot more going on like under the surface in this one. Uh, so they, they wind up in this house. Um, it's a really cool Brooklyn townhouse and if anybody I mean I live near New York in the suburbs I used to live in the city anybody knows New York real estate like this is such a find for them you know it's just like the perfect family and the perfect home and it comes with somebody who's kind of keeping an eye on the house it seems and they're not sure but um it, it kind of plays out that yeah that is the case there's somebody watching there's somebody watching they're watching the other family and it's it's definitely this creepy kind of thing of what is actually going on? And you really don't figure out so much, much later in the book because you're constantly being twisted of, is it this, is it that, is it the other? So where did the idea for this one come from? Because I know you said you had like a kernel of an idea. What ended up happening with that? Yeah, so the idea, and I can't have a spoiler here because the idea came to me, the twist. Like, so there's a twist at the very end of this book. And I think it's, you know, hopefully if I did my job, like it's a real blind side. And that came to me first. I thought, what if, you know, what if I could pull this off? Um, you know, could I do this? And so I worked backward from there. You know, a lot of times you think of the premise or just a kernel of a setup, but in this case, it was the ending that came first. And then I had to sort of plug characters in and think, you know, what would make this really interesting? So I was working on this um, beginning of March, 2020 is when I started uh, this idea. I, I was out of contract at that point. I had just finished something. So I started writing it and my house was suddenly full of people working from home. You know, my sons were suddenly back. Um, my younger son, I pulled him out of college. So he was here miserable. It was, he was a college senior and I made him sit there and listen to the plot one day. Cause I was trying to sort of cheer him up a little maybe with my murder plot. I'll cheer you up with my suspense novel. <laughs> He's used to me, but I was kind of trying to engage him because he was so miserable and I thought he wasn't really even listening. And then he said, you know, mom, like that's a really good idea, but what if you did this? And he twisted it again. I was like, oh, that's really good. I don't know if I could pull that off. So I didn't do that in the initial version that I sent the publisher. I wrote the proposal, I sent it in. And my editor had two other editors over there read it um, with feedback for me. And one of them said, this is really good, but you know what, you should even take another step. And it was his twist. It was my son's twist. I was wow. like, you were right. So that's wow. how the book um, plays out. And you know, then like, you had to just go write it because you know, everybody got to do yeah. stuff. Now you just have to go write it and make it work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And we cut the whole opening. Like I had given them, you know, proposal, like three chapters and an outline and the three chapters aren't even in the book now because it started in a different place. Like I just scrapped everything. It's very fast forward. Like this book is much more streamlined, I think, than yes. Yes. my usual. Um, it, I felt like I was starting it in the middle, 
but once I let that take hold, it was great. It was, it really felt like it moved. So, and it doesn't feel like you started in the middle. It feels like it started exactly where it should be. You know, sure sometimes not. you sit there and say, oh, I threw out those 300 pages and oh, blah, 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 blah. I wish I hadn't, but no, no, it just has I the know. right feel. I don't. Right feel. I keep the pages. Like I have a hard time throwing them away. I, I put them in another document. So I don't feel quite as like I'm now flying without a net, you know, so I keep them and I know what happened. And I think it's good to have written them. I always tell authors that too. You can write all the stuff, but try to pull it out like later. Mm -hmm. It's good for you to know if you need to develop it that way. And in this case, boy, did I do that. Mm -hmm. But you also got your then in the place. You were like there, you knew what was going to happen. You knew who the people were, which yeah. That's where, and that's what really works on the book. It's told from three perspectives. It's Nora Howell, the mother of the family who's moved from California, Stacy, her teenage daughter, and Jacob, someone who is watching the house, but we don't know much about him. We really don't. Did you always set it up to sell it from the three perspectives? Yeah, you know, I love, so the teenage, I love writing teenagers. I started out as a YA writer like years ago. And Carol, you and I have been together for years, so you know that about me. <laughs> right? I, I, I used to write YA. Um, so yeah, it was comfortable for me to do that. And I always like multiple viewpoints. I really like this teenage daughter. I thought, you know, she's a true crime buff, like mm -hmm. I was. And she's really into Lizzie Borden, like I was at that age. And I used to worry my parents. <laughs> but, um, but I loved that character and developing her. And she's kind of a misfit. There are two teenage daughters, actually. Uh, one is you know, not a misfit and the other one feels like she is. And so mm -hmm. I really like that awkward kind of um, teen. I do that a lot in my book and family, domestic drama, you know, to me, that's really makes it fraught with tension. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and I had a funny feeling because you've written YA, you knew how to write her voice. You knew how to nail like exactly what she was doing. And if you're a true crime buff, you completely understand what that personality is like because they could just lock themselves in a room and go down the rabbit hole and leave every, read everything about the murder and be totally happy all day long. That's what they did. You know? Right. And in this case, there was an unsolved murder in the house. It was a triple homicide. It was a family um, was murdered 25 years ago. Killer was never caught. And the daughter, once she hears that is just kind of, you know, she starts delving into the internet. Like she wants to not necessarily solve the crime, but she's really you know, into it. I guess. Yeah. And, and it's happened in the house and they weren't told by the realtor ahead of time. And is there a law that you have to do that or not? And you like, you know, look into that. Because I did look into that. Yeah. Really interesting. Do you have to say that someone died in the house? The house has been vacant and they're basically at a dinner party with, with neighbors and neighbors go, oh, and somebody, <laughs> there's a triple homicide in the house and nobody's lived there. And it's like this walk, like out of the blue. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Because it's kind of matter of fact, and of course, you know, it's the kind of thing in New York, and, and I loved playing with the New York neighborhood because on some levels it feels very, you know, insular and people know each other. You can run into somebody, you know, it feels like a small town in some ways. And in other ways, there's an anonymity that worked for this plot because it is New York City. Um, and there are murders, you know, it's not like a small town where everybody would just be for all of these years focused on that. So... Yeah, yeah it's, it's a way that this would, you know, just be able to do. So there's this huge backstory. Did, how much of that did you plot in advance? Like you said, you started there. Did you, you wrote the whole backstory of what happened? Yeah, I did. Um, so the, the murder 25 years ago, I actually, I spent days and days and days back in, let's see, what was it? It was the early nineties, I guess it was 93. Now I can't remember exactly. So again, math, sorry. Um, but it was, it, I actually knew that it was unfolding when the Tanya Harding, Nancy Kerrigan thing was, you know, I had that playing on a TV. Like I had, I was right back there and I wrote all of that. I loved writing the past, but it bogged down the book. So it's gone. But I, I did do a lot of homework on that. And I spent, you know, days, weeks writing it. And you, you know, you're right. Setting it in Brooklyn, it's like setting it in a small town because everybody does run into each other on the street. Not everybody has a car. People will see each other. Like here, I see people walking dogs. That's just about it. And everyone seems to got a dog during the pandemic. I look out the window, go, oh, walking a dog again, you know? Yeah. Then it snowed yesterday it was, or Saturday. I was like, oh, glad I don't have a dog. But that's yeah. all you, you know, that you see. But in Brooklyn, you actually see this. And the houses in the neighborhood, I felt like were characters in the story as well. Because at one point, um, the son of one of the people in the neighborhood, Lennon says, oh, I know exactly what your house looks like. I know where your bedroom is. And she's like, how do you know that? And he goes, well, you're the first born child. So that's the bedroom that right. you get. And this is the bigger bedroom. And, da -da. 
And it was just so interesting because there were also the quirks of the house where um, there's only one bathroom everyone needs to share. And what's that's like? So right. to look into what one of those houses were, was this some Zillow research of let me find a house that I could put here and then duplicate over here? It was it was some Zillow, but it was also some of that claustrophobic kind of feeling and the togetherness was coming out of my suddenly sharing my space with like two sons, two, three cats, sometimes three cats, my husband, like everybody at home, everybody on top of each other for those months when I was writing this, um, like that family, cause they moved, right. And they didn't know anybody in New York and there was enforced togetherness. Like they don't have suddenly the big spread, the big yard, the, you know, the cars. So they were kind of forced to be together. And when I look at it now, I, it's like, you know, it's like 101. Like I can see that coming. It's very claustrophobic in some ways. And it's also like, they don't really know each other in certain ways because they were living their lives independently. Like people do, you know, just like my family did. And then all of a sudden you're thrown together and you have nobody else. And, and there's one bathroom and the other bathroom is in the basement. Right. Right. And all of a sudden, one day your mother's taking a shower in the basement. You're like, why? Right. You know, why? Why, <laughs> why, why did you do that? <laughs> did you take a shower in that? Did you draw a map of like where the two houses were and to get to the park and you know all to get to the subway just so you had some sense of it or was it just in your head? It was just in my head because I'm really careful when I do something like that. If it's a real place and at that point I was locked down, I couldn't go to the actual, I had a neighborhood of mine and I have friends that lived there, they helped me. But I was really, I, I was trapped here. Like we couldn't go into the city and, and go walk around the neighborhood. So um, when I'm writing a setting, if I can't get there, I tend to like sort of be, I'm either vague or I fictionalize. And in this case, I fictionalized the park. You know, I kind of yeah. knew where I was, but I didn't want to commit because also I needed things to be a certain way. Like there's mm -hmm. a loft by, by the river. And I did spend a lot of time on Google earth, like, checking lofts by the river and the warehouse district over there. Like I knew the areas, but I needed them to work for my plot. Yeah, they did to work for like what your ending was and what you were yeah. going to do. Yeah. So the YA really helped you writing these characters and you're like, what's going on? Um, the also walking the dog, speaking of walking the dog, <laughs> gives people purpose because you can say, I'm going to go walk the dog and then you can go meet your boyfriend, Lennon, and you can go walk the dog and go do whatever you're going to do. But the dog is sort of like your foil and a chance to be able to um, put the plot forward. I know you're a cat person, but you can't walk the cat. So right. that's why they always got to walk the dog. <laughs> yes. And I actually love dogs too. And in this case, I really amused myself because it's a pug and he's really lazy and tired. And the dog, like, they're like, come on, let's go for a walk. And he's like, I'm sleeping like this, this poor dog, you know? <laughs> so I just, um, I love, and his name is Cato, sort of a nod to the true crime, uh, like Cato Kalen. Uh, okay. I got it. Then. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. Was Cato like who was, and was home the night of the, the OJ shooting. Right. I'm like, is this a sly nod? So I am so glad I I got that because this morning I was, I was like that Cato, I've got to make sure it's Cato Kalen was it spelled yeah. the same way. It oh, was Kelsey. because, and um, he came, he was a stray who showed up and stayed. And I kind of thought, okay, they really into true crime, especially the daughter. So yeah, that works for me. And I really like the true crime. I like that. I, I just, I like that theme. I liked playing with it all the way through. So yeah. Well, my Kato computer's really so that we heard of. As soon as I saw that with the dog, I was like, okay, that's Kato Kato. Because who, like, where's that name coming from? You know, it's not Kato. You know what I mean? It's like, now, and Nora's also a horticulturist and clearly loves being in the garden, which gave her an excuse to go out and find something that was pivotal to the story. Are you channeling your own love of gardening into her too? Because she's got this extremely successful garden. And I love when she goes over to the other people's house, she's looking, and I feel like yeah. people could do this to me, they're looking yeah. at the plant and going, oh, that shouldn't be here. That should be moved. I wonder if they let me do redo their front porch. Okay. Is that you? Yeah. And she's a frustrated horticulturalist. I mean, that was her career. Um, but I wrote this through the summer then. So I sold it in the spring, wrote it through the summer on my deck to get away from my family who working in the house. So I was surrounded by, I am a gardener. I'm an avid gardener. So I think that really a lot of that worked its way in. I loved writing. I, I think I thought of writing a gardener very early on, um, but it just spoke to me. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. Well, it's really funny. We had on our front porch mums, these beautiful purple mums and they come out late, right? Now they're dead. Okay. So we have, well, there's 
with the Christmas tree, this just shows that COVID times are just like so pathetic for people, right? So this huge Christmas leaf with a pot light on it. I made these beautiful, I did this arrangement with these big sticks in front of the house and I like put magnolia leaves and all this stuff and lights. But the lights we bought this year are on 24 hours a day. Like we look like idiots in the neighborhood. So then I realized the other day because I don't leave the house and go like that way looking at the house that much. And I was like, oh my God, the dead mums are still up. Like we have to take these down. This I'm mortified. Like people are gonna drive by and go, first you got the lights on 24 hours a day. Like, you know, it's just like the, 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 the deli or something like that. And then he's like, so my husband takes them down, brings them in. They're now in the front hallway. And I'm like, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> it's now it's snowed and you can't go throw them over the fence in the back. Yeah. When, I was, when I was reading the horticulture parts and she wanted to redo, I'm like, oh, there are so many oh, things. God. I have not deadheaded like X, Y, Z. I don't do any of this stuff. Yeah, it was great. No, it's me too. I, I texted my neighbors were all in a group text, apologizing for my Christmas lights the other night because I went out to get the paper at night or the mail late and I saw that they were still on because we don't leave the I don't leave the house and drive by I forgot I had them on a timer but I was like oh it's January I'm that neighbor sorry they're like and I have a lot of Christmas lights <laughs> well we have a lot of neighbors that still have the lights on we just feel like everybody feels like Christmas didn't happen so yes, I know just the lights on. we went out one night and my husband goes look at all the people with lights still on you know no. I've got the candles in the windows that never are on the right timer. They call oh, like, right here. They're some on go right on now. three, some go on at four, some go off at eleven. So and I envy those people who have like the whole house synchronized. It's not us. I so know. all right. Not so the horticulture, I wasn't wrong on. I wasn't right. wrong that it was like you're you channeling were. the perfect Good. whatever. Right. Okay. And then there's this painting in the house that has a dead woman who's propped up. Okay, did paintings like that actually exist? Because I thought that was so creepy that she's still part of the family. And not, up. Yes, and it's not a painting. It's a photograph. It's a photograph. So that's a real thing. It's a Victorian mourning tradition. Um, and I had stumbled across this years ago. It always fascinated me. But when you think about it, it makes sense. I mean, back then, I mean, they didn't have cameras where they were taking pictures all the time. So a lot of times when someone died and death was much more pervasive, I think in their lives, young people, you know, they didn't have a whole trove of photographs. And a lot of times they would pose with the corpse. So they'd have an image to save and they would paint eyes on um, the photographer would paint eyes on as if they were alive. So this is a thing it's called memento mori. And um, I researched it extensively. I did it for another book and I never made it in. And then this time I was like, so there's an old photograph on the wall and you can see that it's the same house. And it's a Victorian couple with their dead daughter, which you don't know, you know, like Nora finds out later, like you don't know at a glance. And then the neighbor's like, oh, she's dead. <laughs> oh my God. Let's have some people over for dinner and they go, oh, that's a dead person in that picture over there. You know? This portrait. Yeah, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of having at least one on the wall with the original picture from the photograph in it, but I don't have any dead people, you know, no dead people. <laughs> so the book's also got four parts and were that decided as you wrote, or was that part of the editing process later? Because I took note that it's like part one, part two, part three, part four. What am I doing here? Yeah, it felt organic and it happened in retrospect. Like I got I think I got to part like halfway through and I realized this is really unfolding in sections. So that came later. But like I said, like this is much more, I think streamlined might be the right word. Um, it's um, it reads differently. It reads. It's a very fast paced read. So the sections are not chapters this time. They're character viewpoints and yes. the parts to me felt natural because without chapters, I kind of felt like maybe it was a little too loosely structured for my traditional writing style. <laughs> so, so I put them in and then we were back and forth on whether they would stay and then they did. So yeah, no, I was comfortable. It, it works because you feel like you're going to some kind of transition. It's like, where yeah. am I transitioning to? Where am I going to? Blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. Is there a certain freedom to writing a standalone? Because first of all, the first book of a trilogy, you're all, all in like five. But then you realize that whatever that person does, you've got to do for the next couple of books. How freeing was it to just do this and it happened, it happened? Yeah, like it was, especially after writing, I think I wrote, I wrote four or five, I think I wrote five trilogies back to back and I have a mystery series that I do as well. So 
I'm used to dwelling in a world and being not a prisoner of the world. I like the worlds that I create and I miss them when they're gone. And I feel like I really know them very well. But yeah, like you said, you do something really in an offhand way in book one and you just wrote yourself into a corner for book three. And I didn't have to worry about that here. It was it was so freeing and it wrote itself so much more quickly. I mean, it just was it was it was what I needed. Mm. It was what I needed as a writer. It wasn't captive to an original plot. It was just like, OK, let's just take this. And you didn't have to read a th leave a thread for later on. It was no, so nice. And I feel like it's completely complete. A couple, I think last year, I interviewed uh, Lisa Gardner. And she had just written what she said was going to be a standalone with Frankie as her character. And now she's writing a second book. And yeah, I was like, that happens. <laughs> there goes the standalone. There goes the standalone. But I feel like this one complete. It stands alone. It completely works. Yes, I wonder what will happen to characters. But it's I'm yeah. fine with that. So do you outline work from a first draft? What do you, it was a messy first draft. I know you said you had the end of this done, but the, the beginning? <laughs> yeah, I'm the worst outliner. I mean, it's like such a thing among writers. Are you a pantser or a plotter? And you know what? I really don't know very many plotters, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I am definitely a pantser. And luckily at this stage in my career, I am able to give my editor a kind of loosey-goosey outline and say, you know, not sure what this is going to be, but something's going to happen here or moment of drama, not sure what it is, you know, that kind of thing. Because I know the beats, like, I guess I know what's coming, but I just hate getting bogged down. And I also hate being boxed in by that. You know? Yeah. So there was a lot yeah. of freedom in, in, I knew where this was going because I started at the end, but it was very yeah. loosely plotted. We begin at the end. We begin at the end. So how, okay. So what you've written, like a lot went out. This is pretty close to what you've like came up um, or were, was it like lots happening in the editing process or is this pretty close? Oh to no, this is pretty close. This was pretty close. We, um, we talked and it needed, I just don't want to give anything away. It needed a little touch at the end that came in at the very, very end. And it's pretty prominent. Um, Cause I just felt like characters needed motivation and they also needed to be, sympathetic like the reader just needs to understand I think in the end and when you're writing something that's that fast paced you don't want to drop that and just sort right. of be like oh it just you know I hate when that happens as a reader I hate that so mostly though it was complete I did cut I like I told you I cut those first three chapters before I started writing it but I also cut probably I don't know 20,000 words of it maybe more um after it was written yeah before yeah. I gave it to my editor just to get it tighter, just to get it tighter. Just to get it really tight. I was, that was what I was going for this time. Because I, and you've been in this business a long time. We both know, I, I mean, publishing has changed. Readers have changed and their expectations have changed and everything is so much more um, instant gratification. I felt mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I was very aware of that as I was writing. Because as a reader, I, I, I read on audio and I cannot fast forward and I cannot go back. So, uh, and I, because I read when I'm swimming, I'm underwater. That was what I was going to bring up when we got to the audio book. You're the one that reads when you swim. I just like love this. I read when it's I swim. And I'm always aware of, wow, it's kind of dragging, you know? So now I'm much more conscious of that as I'm writing. I try to be much more aware of that. Like, don't, yeah, don't throw everything in. It becomes a side stroke. It becomes a breast stroke <laughs> instead of a fast butterfly or a free or I'm like pausing it, like, what just happened? Wait, I missed it. And you can't, you can't rewind. And Harlan Coben, who I often read, love Harlan, uh, is famous for having these drowning scenes or like somebody's being pushed underwater and I'm reading them or he's got funny stuff and I'm like laughing and, and, and drowning as I'm reading. I think you're drowning at the same time. I know you, you've also often talked about you do a lot of listening while you're swimming and that's where and you listen to more books than you read would you yeah, say oh, way more because I'm blind <laughs> yeah, I can barely see anymore I have my glasses right here my readers so it's much more comfortable for me and also I'm a multitasker and the other thing is I used to only read when I was on vacation when I wasn't writing something because I felt like it would seep into my head and I'm a visual person if I'm not reading it, it doesn't interfere with the writing process. I learned that audio, I read it in an entirely different way. I'm hearing it. So when I'm writing my own stuff an hour later, I don't know. It's just the way my brain is wired. Your brain works. Awesome. It wasn't like you were reading it. It's not like you were saying, oh, I would move this, this, this. It's you're just no. listening to the story. Right. Really listening to the story. What do you use to swim? Because everybody's going to ask. What, what do you use? Oh, it's my little, I don't have it right here, but it's uh, Underwater Audio um, okay. it's a company. And they do, they take old um the little tiny uh ipad shuffles that used to be back in the day and you clip it to your swimsuit they they make them waterproof 
and it's technology that it, you clip it to here and you put the ear pods in and you can do music or podcasts. I will be listening to your podcast. Now I know you have many that I have to catch up on. Um, so yeah, you can listen and swim. It makes the hour go by much more. A lot faster. Yeah, if you're doing something else. It's funny because this weekend I was, I was trying to, trying to th- third week in a row, just sit on the uh, couch and read. And I always mm-hmm. find that I, being a multitasker, do you know what my thing is? A fire in the fireplace is the second thing. Because then you're <laughs> watching the fire while you're reading. Fire. It's like- but it's like, Over the really, book. yeah, it's like, I'll get on the exercise bike and read because it's two things that it's got to always be right. two things. And I'm like, Me too. that's just, that's just what I'm going to do. I finished part of this on the exercise bike. And then Saturday when it snowed, I just like, I think I'll just stay in bed and read Wendy's book. I have to talk to her on Monday. <laughs> do, do not disturb. I'm not shoveling. You know what I mean? Oh God. Yeah. Good move. <laughs> good move. Good move. So I see this classified as suspense and I would say thriller. So explain what the difference is between thriller and suspense, because I've never known the difference and I've been doing this for how many years? I really don't. Oh, and then you bring mystery in. So mystery, yes. thriller, suspense, it's kind of like, so I think I kind of have it down now, which I should after writing, I guess, all three. <laughs> um, and I never know exactly what I'm writing or how it'll be categorized. And this, I would say, is suspense because suspense to me is the ticking clock and something is is going to happen. So you're kind of mm-hmm. foreshadowing, I feel like. And in in mystery, a lot of times the thing is already happening. You're trying to unravel it. And in thriller, it's happening. So although it is happening here, so this is kind of a hybrid. And I understand why, you know, I would say thriller, suspense, thriller. Um, mm-hmm. But suspense is it's kind of building towards something and you you get these little clues and you feel like you know something's coming. I've got it. I've got it. Now I've got it because I was like, wait, this is suspense. I'm writing it as thriller. What is going on? And I think that's a really good definition because it's be building towards it. It's either that or it's there. And okay. Yeah. Or it's there or it's unfolding. It's adrenaline every minute and um, unfolding as you go. So I've got it because this was unfolding, but the story was already something. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. And there's a foreshadowing for sure there because yeah. you know there was this unsolved crime. So was this always the title? The other family was this always the title. It it was a title that I fought for. Um, it went through I think three different titles, um, but this one I really loved because we really wanted it to scream domestic suspense because that mm-hmm. again that's a subcategory and that's what it is. Um, and so I was looking for like something like wife or house or fa- you know family really worked for me. And then you go on like we go on, uh, my editor and I, and my agent, like we're always on, you know, line, looking at online bookstores, checking for titles. Like, has someone done this or have they done it in the last however many years or, you know, but at one point, I think Lisa Gardner and I came out with Live to Tell, I think by accident, the same month and we didn't know it. Like that happens sometimes. And they were totally different books, but titles are tricky. Well, it's, tr- it's hard right now because Made, the Netflix series, is based on the book, the nonfiction, and The Maid is a very big thriller right now. Right. So you've got which one, like you're going to the store and somebody goes to me, because we're, my book club is going to read The Maid. And they said, well, wait a second. It's like one by Stephanie Land. And I'm like, no, right. no, 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 no. Because if you don't put the in front of it, you don't have the right book. And it is tricky. It is tricky to try to find. This has kind of like, this cover's got like a Sherry LaPena kind of feel to it to yeah. me. That's which is real going. that domestic suspense was this i think we went through lots of cover changes in fact i'm not sure if i have the last one I'm, this on is my the, uh, yeah you might is that the arc or is that the this, this is, is the finished arc. book or maybe it's not no, Whoops, no, this is the proof i did get my finished copies and they are here i'm sorry i thought i had it but i don't it's okay but um, it's close. it was very similar yeah that was the art yeah that was the art and okay i liked the color scheme i was um you know, I'm, I was heavily involved in this cover, my agent too. We've been on the last few. Yeah, and, and I like because the houses are there, they're next to each other. You see to see what's going down, even though they're down the street. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if this is the last one, but I think it's close. Yes, so, it is. The same one. So Hillary Hoover narrates the audio. Did you pick her? Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, I did pick her. She's done my last few and I listened to my own on audio and that is rough because I'm swimming and I can't get a pen and edit myself. I'm like, ah. I hate that turn of phrase <laughs> or I repeated myself, um, but Hillary's so great. And oh, she does a great teenage girl. I can't wait to hear this. I don't have a sample. I actually pre-ordered it um, on my audible. <laughs> so it's gonna, I'm 
paying for it because I wanted <laughs> that morning. I was like, I could ask them. I mean, they'll give me a sample, but I'm like, you know what? It's, it's harder to download to my little device that way. And I'm like, oh, right. I'll just get it. I'll buy it. Um, so yeah, Hillary, I can't wait to hear how she does Stacey because she's just such a good, she's great. I just listened to her. She just did um, Sarah Strohmeyer's book. She was, she was on that one. I love Sarah and I love that book. And uh, I was like, oh, you got Hillary Huber too. She's great. That's fantastic. But you know, okay, speaking of that, a lot of authors are reading their books aloud before they turn the book in for that listening for the turn of phrase being the same yes. and all these kinds of things. And they said, if you read it aloud, all of a sudden you're, why am I saying that? That doesn't right. not make, make sense. It's like, have you, being that you're such an auditory like yeah. aficionado, have you tried reading it? At, at, oh, I do do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do that. I do the dialogue loud. Yeah, I'm always like murmuring to myself around the house. I'm, yeah, I do. I, I read it a lot. I learned that a long time ago. I learned that when I was an editor. Uh, one of the editors was giving that advice to an author, and I absorbed it and used to give it to my authors. And I do it. I I always say it's that. It's it's read aloud, it but it's also take a step back if you have the time. And just let it sit for like a week or two at least so that you have some perspective because you're not what's the story and then they jump out at you so how long ago were you an editor and where were you an editor i'm trying to remember i forgot about that part of your career it was before yeah, I, that was, I was young it was um i was in my early 20s so in new york um at silhouette books it was part of okay. tour star uh harlequin and Tar tour star and it's funny because Har harlequin is now swallowed up by my current publisher william morrow harper collins so we're all together again. <laughs> wow. But that, yeah. you know, that, that moment of being on the other side of the desk, I think gives a lot of perspective. I interviewed Anita Prose who wrote The Maid and she's actually a um, big, uh, she is an editorial director up in Canada for Simon & Schuster. So she said that now she thinks about publishing in a different way because she sat on the other side of the desk and was edited and how you give notes and how you have conversations with people and things like that. And she said, it's just given her a different kind of a perspective. So you had it going in of what's going to happen when it sits on somebody's desk for two months because they're just busy. And you know what that whole thing is like right now. You know so that. You and you also know that if you drop the ball on your end, so many people go down on that. <laughs> like you can't afford to be late. And I, I have been late in the past. Like I, I hate that I have been a few times when things got in the way, but I really try to make my deadlines. I really try to turn around, you know, page proofs right away because I know there are so many people involved and so many moving parts because I used to do it. So right. it makes you very conscientious, I think, as an author. And you understand, too, that it's bigger than you. It's not just about you and your art. You know? <laughs> your art. <laughs> like yeah. I could have a great idea for a cover or a title, but if marketing and sales don't like it, like I defer to them because that's their job, you know, that's and I job. understand that, that, you know. So. What's interesting is two weeks before, no, oh, end of January before the pandemic. So I guess six weeks before life changed, I was at Penguin Random House's distribution center. Like it was at where their warehouse is. And it was fascinating that you saw tractor trailers coming in with books on them from the printer. And then what happened from there? And then how they were being shipped, whether they're being shipped, whether there's a whole carton of such and such going, or there was a palette of such and such going places and to just sit there and watch and then their books they're coming in peace like there's one two three four they're going to go to x store right. one two three four they're going this and you're holding for the fifth and like when do you and you walk through that and realize <laughs> and then people were on those elevated cranes it's not what they're called but those, these those carriages they put somebody up and you saw the scope of what was going on oh and i just sat there and i thought this is pretty amazing of thing that has to go from the printer to get to the person. But was really wild is a couple weeks later when the pandemic hit, you thought, how are all those people? Like oh, at the beginning, it was, you remember, wash, wash, you're washing your mail. Right, you were right, washing everything. Right. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how yeah. is this actually happening? These books are getting out, they're getting places, you know, blah, blah. And it was one of those moments where you thought of the people in the warehouse because I'd actually been there. And you realize like the, the truck coming in and was everything going to be on time? And I mean, just the last week, I heard that there are two cookbooks that are being delayed because they were on a big um, bar, like one of those uh, yeah, ships. Like, container, uh, uh, container fell in the water. Oh, God. So the two pub dates have moved and whatever. And it, it just shows the other moving parts of publishing that oh, yeah. we're, 
and you know that if you if you're late who it's going to hold up along the way and a lot of times if you haven't sat there I've often had since somebody publishing could you just walk me through a PL? could you just walk me through the process of what ends up happening because when you get to marketing and publicity which we're at there's so much that's happened before and so much later and even how to um, stage something so it happens over a couple of more weeks instead of like, bam, the interview, right. bam, it's right. over, That's bam, key. what to do. Yeah, what to do to do that as well. So Because it's a business. And I think the interesting piece of it for authors is that we are coming at it as artists in the beginning, like you have this creative side. So it was really hard, I think for me, and this is all really um, relevant to me because it was really important to learn that it was a business and right. I have to build a brand. And I did go to the warehouse. I used to go, I used to go, I used to bring you know cookies and muffins to booksellers and, and warehouse people um, earlier in my career. I did a lot of that to thank them because I had, I was lucky. I had editors who, you know, and marketing people who said, you know, this is a really good thing to do. And we want you to see, and it stays with you, just like you said, it does. Stays with it does. You. and this book was delayed because of the pandemic, because, you know, the pub date is pushed back a few weeks and they were so apologetic and like, it's beyond our control. And I was like, look, I get it. Like I can't get toilet paper or bread or whatever. Like I understand it's bigger than you and, and mm -hmm. we're helpless. Like everybody's doing yeah. their best, you know? Well, everybody's waiting for paper and things like that. My husband does um, water uh, purification. Like that's what he is involved in is um, environmental, like what, what happens with water. And wow. he's like, I got to tell you something. Most of the printing plants along the river are like out of business. And I said, well, did they all switch over to making um, cardboard? Because we use so much more cardboard these days. He goes, no, that's a totally different process. And he says, making of paper is actually not environmentally friendly like the, the uh -oh. slew that goes into the waters and stuff like that. So a lot of the plants have closed down that were in the Midwest and stuff. And he was walking me through this when I was like, this is like, you know, fascinating. He does things with zebra mussels. He does things with a marine oh, anti-fouling wow. is really yeah. what he, his business is, is worked on. But it's when you hear that, like why, why printing is an issue right now, why it is a problem besides everybody wanting to do it, you know? Right, and besides books places. doing so well, which we love, right? We right. love that people want books and more and more books. But yeah, it's it's bigger than all of us, you know. I forget awesome. whose book in the fall, or maybe it was Barack Obama's book that was um actually published in Germany, it was printed in Germany, and the copies were brought over mm -hmm. because there was not the capacity to do here. Somebody's big book. I want to say it was either fall, spring, I don't know. It's all molds together at this point. But I remember hearing that it was printed overseas because it was easier to do there. The the volume couldn't happen here. And I was fascinated by that. I think it was his, but I, I could be wrong on whose book it is. It's not, but it just the fact it happened was like right. That's incredible. Whoa. And a lot, a lot of four color is done overseas. A lot of four color work is done. And that's a big problem because if it's not coming in on the containers or whatever, that's a yeah. really big problem for anything with um, four color. So with all of this going on for this book, of course, we want to know what's next. Standalone series, a trilogy. What are we up to? Oh, God. Yeah. So, so I have, well, there's the other family, but I also have a series that I do, and this is Lilydale Mysteries. So this one just came out, uh, Pros and Cons, and the fifth is coming out. I just finished writing it. It's called Stranger Vanishes, and it's coming out uh, later this year. So that is happening, but I also sold another standalone to Harper, to William Morrow. So it's about, I think you'll like this. I love it. Um, it's about three college friends, old college friends who get together for a girl's weekend and they buy a ticket for, and this came out of like the Powerball jackpots that are recently, you know, on the news and everything. They're like, oh yeah, let's just chip in. They chip in, they win the half a billion dollars <laughs> and they live all, all spread out all over the country. So they hire a lottery, a sudden wealth woman who's going to come. She's like, don't tell anyone. You can't reveal. And I learned a lot about sudden wealth. I don't have it, but I learned a lot about it. You know, don't tell anybody that you've won this ticket and they're all going to meet and form a trust to claim the prize. And the one who has the ticket, which is bearer specific, um, she vanishes and they don't know, like, is it foul play? Did she take off with it? It's so it's three women. I'd love that. And the fourth woman is the one who runs this. Um, she's kind of an enigmatic figure. Um, so I love the idea. It's called Windfall. That's the working title. But then someone said, oh, I think that was a TV show at one point. So title again, I'm like, mm. you yeah. never know. 
but windfall and it's to their husbands now do they tell anybody or no they can't that's um yeah that's, that, uh, that's part of the that's part of the that's part of it. That's part of it. Get too into it, but yeah, I just love the idea of because I noticed because I played Powerball. I think for the first time, like last year or two years ago, and I looked at the ticket and said, "This is bearer specific." And I was thinking, so if you lose it, because I am like I have papers flying around my head all the time, you lose it and someone finds it. So that's where that idea went, and then it sort of went with, "But what if you're sharing? And what if and, and the only one who matters is the person who's holding it?" So wow, wow, that's great. That's great. That's fun plot. Later this really year, I'm writing it so right. what do we think this time next year what do you think this time probably next? yeah we think so it's due to my editor in a few months in the spring um so we'll see uh i was on a different publishing schedule and this is a new time of year for me i used to be more in the spring like april may summer so i i kind of like this yeah I, I would expect next year at this time it'll make touring in winter a challenge but other than that <laughs> it's just fine <laughs> all touring these days <laughs> Thank it, God it, for Zoom. It, it's really funny. What did Linwood Barkley say? He says, I haven't lost my luggage or missed a flight. He's has been really good the last two really years. Good. You know, <laughs> I have two of Linwood's books that you loaned me on my shelf behind me that you're probably like, give those back. Those are mine. <laughs> give those back to me. Give those back to me. And I love Linwood. You were right. <laughs> you love Linwood. Yeah, he's got a I new do. one out and I just like can't wait. It's um out in the UK this week. We don't get it till later, but it's at, we, I think May, May for us. Okay. I was working on a newsletter with him and he's just really funny because it's like, oh, this is what's going on. This is and he's got another it. book coming in June. So it's uh, an ebook. So the book will probably be print by the end of the year. But it's so much fun because you're just seeing everything unfolding in different ways. Because I've known you a long time. You did and my we website, Carol, my first website. I remember when we met, oh my God, years and years ago. Like, I think I had like three books. And I was like, Carol, I got a lot of books. What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> You guys ever so, we did it a couple of years ago. And we're like, oh my gosh, she's got so many books. I all know we're like, gonna do this. You're so patient with me. You and your team have been there all along. Um, and it's so nice to see you again because of we usually know, see each other a few times a year. It's been so interesting though, because we're not together, but I said I couldn't have done this if I didn't have 25 years behind me. Like I couldn't be new right. at doing you this. Contact. But you by the, the same token. Like, and I understand more about how publishing works. And I understand this. And we've sort of been on every side of everything sort of at this point, but it's, it's fun because when you work on the websites with an author, you really get to know how they're building their brand and how they're sharing news and be able to sort of work together to figure yeah. out how to do that. And what's the best way to do it really makes it a lot of fun. Well, but you were the pub day changes and then I know, <laughs> I know, but you're you were always sort of ahead of the curve on that. I always found that fascinating. I really respect that I've got to say because not everybody thinks of it that way. And um, you know, you guys are really good about building out my site. Even I have two identities. Like I have a light side and a dark side, and we have, you know, we've managed to brand all of that. I think that's important. So yeah, thank it's, you. <laughs> it's just been it's been really, really fun because you learn a lot as you do this. You learn, I think we've built, I think close to 400 at this point. And we're probably maintaining at this point about 120. And it's interesting because I actually need to do a sheet. Like I started working on this and then you know something else got in the way of everything that everybody has coming up. Like because we take the pub date very seriously. So yeah. when the pub dates this and then the pub date moves, we're yeah. like, whoa, 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 we've got to change the page, you've got to change right. like everything that's going on. Right. And it's been, this year's been, it's been challenging because a lot of stuff has moved. A lot of stuff. I, has it wasn't and, just me. My agent actually told me to brace myself. She uh, called me back in November and she's like, I'm sending you an article. I think it was in the times. And she's like, I just want you to know this is happening to our industry. So let's just think of that date as maybe a little fluid. And I was like, what, <laughs> you know, but, but she yeah. was right. And I really did roll with it. I thought we're doing the first event, like a real live event at Mysterious Bookshop in the city. And that moved. But it turned out to be a good thing because everything was kind of shut down and now it's opening up a little more. So I really right. wanted to do it a few weeks ago. And now it's for February 10th. And I feel like that's better. It's it better. It's like things are moving in this is we're moving towards better. But right. I don't think we're ever going to move completely where we were before. I personally am thrilled with the opportunity to do interviews like this yeah. because we can bring you to a lot of authors, a lot of readers who have never been to a live event and could never go to a live event. Right. And instead of having like, you know, a three second, five question interview, instead be able to go in, okay, what is suspense? What's thriller? Explain the difference. So that I, we really enjoy doing that because it gives you an opportunity to do something else and bring it to readers that 
there's never going to be an author event in the town. Like, no, and exactly. And there are fewer anyway. There are fewer, there were fewer before all of this. So fewer uh, events, I mean. But you know, got to the point where I didn't want to get on a plane if it wasn't going to be worth it. I didn't yeah. want to, yeah. I love travel. Don't get me wrong. There was oh, a me too. Of, I know, I miss it, but yeah. There was a yeah. time I went to LA three times within five weeks and it was a lot. I learned a lot, but I don't feel like they need to be doing what I did before. I don't feel like this is because I don't we know. have the and capability it, now to do it in a different way. And I think that in terms of efficiency and cost, it just it just makes so much more sense. And yeah. we get to wear like, okay, I'm wearing sneakers. I'm showing you my, <laughs> <laughs> my gym shoes here. Um, but I mean, it just is so much more like you're in your own habitat, but there's also a way of bringing readers in that's been kind of fun. Like they're like, oh, what's on your shelf? Oh, you know, that's yeah. your class. So it's fun. Well, here's the other thing too is, we're doing this so it's going to run the week the book comes out, okay? And not everyone is going to read the book that week. Right. When you read our word of mouth section on Book Reporter, you realize what people are reading. So they could then go see the interview with the author later when they read the book. Exactly. And I'm starting to tell authors, pick your two, three, four, five best interviews and get them on your page. So right. that people don't have to hunt for them. They've got that there. And there's the great story of what's going on with your book because somebody's going to find this in nine months. And then right. where's the interview? Where's why she wrote this book? It's not there. And all sure. of a sudden you have a treasure trove of interviews online that you didn't have before. Right. Before it was, if you weren't at Mysterious Bookshop that night or Poison oh, yeah. or Murder. And it's irrelevant. It's not, yeah. I know I was trolling your site the other day because I was looking for something. Uh, I was looking for a review of something. You know, you had it all right there. And I remember thinking like, God, I should have looked at this before. I looked for it before I started the book, but it's it was there and it was yeah. fascinating. It was good insight. Yeah, and it's like, Thank okay, you. this is everything right. we want to have, you know, attached to the book or whatever. We have to rebuild those sites. We've got to rebuild them in WordPress. It's just a massive job because we've got, not just so much content, but it's how to organize it right now. And a lot of stuff I've been looking around online, I really just don't like the way it's organized. I just, it, it's not gonna be just a bunch of lines, which a lot of stuff is. It's not just gonna be, but something is just headlines and clicks and I can't stand that. I just don't wanna do it. So I, I'm making myself crazy over doing this because we really, we know, we know the developer we're gonna work with. It's just like the design has got a hit in my head on what to do because you can hand it to a designer, but it's sort of like with your book, you know what your product is, you know what's going on. And that's the difference is, you know how readers are gonna to come to this. And sometimes people hear me step back, like, that's not even, it's not even close to what they're gonna be looking for. Not right. even close, right. you know? No. So yeah, my, my challenge, you know, May I get on this quickly, you know? <laughs> <laughs> now, what would your deadline be for a book coming out next spring? What's the deadline? Well, the deadline's June 1st. Oh, wow. So I've got a couple of months, yeah. And I just finished writing the other one. Um, so I just got notes on, on that from the editor actually this morning. So, so yeah, I've always got a couple of things going at the same time, but I'm about to really sink into the, this is where I do the writing. And I just- Yeah, so, and that's yeah. the reason that, doing events like this and then you can write during the day instead of trying to write on an airplane at four o'clock oh, yeah. in the morning and things like that help yep so absolutely well i look forward to seeing you in person at some point soon but once again congratulations it's really truly well done really really oh. good i was right in there thank you coming from you like that is just like i'm not stopping smiling it made me so happy to hear that thank you so 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 and much. it's so different from the other books of yours that i've read i mean this is this tight concise story and then you sit there and say whoa and yeah we really do want not it. read the end do not read the end because yeah, no, don't read the last page and i love a book like that and i really set out to write one i really wanted a book where you're like whoa and then when you look back it's like well of course but right. like, those are my favorite kinds of books or movies. So I really set out to write that. Thank you for- And then I want to know what happens to that family later. <laughs> I'll call you later. <laughs> I, I, I see, we'll figure out. That'll be the sequel of, you know, okay, yeah. I know, I know, I do know. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, it's such so a pleasure. To you and all of your team. Thank you, thank you. And we'll see thank each other you. soon, I hope. Thanks so much. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time a book reporter talks to. And remember, subscribe to our newsletter, subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an interview and you never miss news about what's coming up. Thanks so much, everyone.